Well, thank you all very much. And uh, I know we're, we're pressed on time, and I, and I want to be mindful of that. Uh, one of the uh, pieces of advice my dad used to give me was uh, you have two ears and one mouth, respect the ratio. So I'm going to do my best to get out of the way and let uh, three folks who are far more uh, uh, adept at this uh, topic uh, dive right into it. But I did want to start off with a couple of uh, points that might help us uh, in, in the context of beginning the discussion. I was looking this up, and uh, there are currently roughly 210 million drivers on Florida's uh, on, on the U.S. roads uh, every day, and they drive roughly six billion miles every single day. And in a policy context, I just wanted to point out some things that I've used in a in a different uh, framework. Uh, that might help uh, us to consider the impact of what we call an economics externality. So uh, in 15 years, a majority of the automobiles on the roads will in fact have some level of automation. By 2040, that figure will be 75% fully automated. Uh, but there's an externality to that, a, ne a negative impact that as policymakers and as folks who advise policymakers, we all need to be mindful of. And so one of these was, was interesting and struck out, uh, stuck out to me. 94% of all traffic fatalities occur by driver error. 30,000 lives will be saved by automated vehicles. However, 30% of all organs harvested for transplant are from the victims of auto fatalities. And consequently, the medical community is having to have a real discussion on the impact of autonomous vehicles on the shortage of organs available for harvest. So I just wanted to throw that out as an interesting fact and then jump right into introducing uh, three great folks uh, who are going to uh, kind of dive into a number of areas uh, of transportation. Jennifer Huddleston over on the end, uh, skis, is a legal researcher research associate for the Project on Innovation and in Governance at Mercatus Center. Uh, she holds a JD from the University of Alabama. We won't hold that against her. And a BA uh, in political science from Wesley College. She's uh, also an alum of the Mercatus Center's Bastiat Fellowship. Uh, her research interests uh, focus on the intersection of emerging technology and law with a special interest in the role of administrative agencies and courts on innovation. Ian Adams, to her right, is the Associate Vice President of State Affairs with R Street Institute, and he's responsible for coordinating all of their outreach and engagement at the state and local level. Uh, he's uh, involved in their uh, insurance research matters uh, related to next generation transportation, and he's also a frequent commentator on disruptive impact burgeoning technologies have on law and regulation. Uh, Ashkin uh, Kazarian is a director of civil liberties and research fellow at Tech Freedom. Uh, she manages and develops policy research on free speech, artificial intelligence, surveillance, and, sh and the sharing economy. And she also handles uh, outreach and coalition building for uh, the organization as well. Uh, she's an inter internet law and policy fellow and expert at the Federalist Society's Emerging Tech Working Group and part of their regulatory transportation uh, project. Now, what I'm going to do is just ask the general question, let them, uh, each panelist, opine, and then we'll jump right into some Q&A. So from your vantage point, we'll start over at Jennifer. From your vantage point, what are the three most uh, important policy-specific initiatives or efforts that state think tanks, and I'm being selfish here because I'm with one of them, <laughs> should be engaged in over the next three to five years in the role of transportation? So Jennifer? Well, thank you for moderating this, Sal, and thank you to everyone for being here. I think that what we really need to realize is that we're on the verge of a transportation renaissance. As Chris vaguely alluded to, we've heard a lot about driverless cars, we've heard a lot about these different technologies, and what we really need to start doing is looking at it as a transportation ecosystem. But with that in mind, I do think there are some clear areas that we are going to see a lot of particularly state and local issues where states and even cities have the opportunity to be true leaders in this. The first one I would say is micro-mobility. So Sal and Chris alluded to the scooters. How many of you have seen or been on a scooter yet? They're popping up everywhere in cities from Salt Lake City to DC to Santa Monica to Nashville and Memphis, and we're seeing a lot of different reactions at a city level. Some good, some bad. <laughs> Second would be the liability and insurance market related to autonomous vehicles. We're definitely going to see a state role in the tort system and in the courts and how these play out. We are going to see a huge reduction in car crashes from autonomous vehicles, but we are going to have new questions arise when those rare crashes do occur. 
And then the third one I would say is for cities to start working collaboratively when they're thinking about transportation. We really need to focus on city and state soft law. I have a paper coming out with Adam Thier and Ryan Hageman on this issue and that soft law is becoming the growing dominant level way of regulating technology through things like guidance documents, sandboxing, collaboration with innovators to come up with solutions that serve both community needs and innovators' needs in a way that allows kind of a, a try and see approach as opposed to a top-down regulatory approach. Ian? Yeah, I, I, I would say I have uh, one overarching theme with three subparts, so if that's all right, so we'll, we'll do it that way. Um, I think that within transportation in particular, the, what we really need states to be focusing on is regulatory modernization. It's something that we run across in the context of highly automated vehicles, in the context of scooters. We so, see a lot of legacy regulation inadvertently changing the path of development for these burgeoning technologies. And so within the framework of regulatory modernization, I think of three separate areas. And the first would be regulatory competency. Uh, you often hear calls for regulation in these new spaces in part because we want people to become comfortable with the technology and you often hear the refrain that some, some structure, some strictures around the technology will add to people's comfort. Well, in some cases there may be a role to make the market regular for regulation, but at the end of the day, if you have the wrong level of government involved, that, that can be a huge problem for the deployment and development of technology. And so, in California, where I'm from, we often hear our governor, Jerry Brown, who is Jesuit educated, talk about the concept of subsidiarity, which is to say the lowest competent level of government should be the level of government that is actually engaged in the oversight of that, uh, that area or that technology. Um, that's Pius XIII who came up with that one for anyone who is not necessarily Jesuit educated like Jerry Brown. Uh, and, then, and then that can mean that we need to be looking at preemption of localities. And this is often a really very tricky issue. We, we saw it initially uh, in some of the early TNC fights. Um, lo local governments have a role to play in the future of transportation. I agree, there's no, there's no doubt about it. But the idea of a patchwork of jurisdictions, hundreds, thousands of jurisdictions, each having a say about the way this technology is deployed could really uh, serve to slow down the adoption of uh, life-saving technologies in some cases. Um, so the next, the next area would be definitional harmony. You, you may not believe this, but when it comes to the definition of an operator of a vehicle, uh, NHTSA, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, FMCSA, which regulates semis, states, and localities, they all have different definitions of what it means to operate a vehicle and be an operator. And so what that means is you've got different technologies, different approaches to the future of transportation that are being encumbered in different jurisdictions inadvertently. What we need to see is some level of harmony and a way of bringing that about. And so state level think tanks can play a really important role in, in bringing that harmony forward into the various jurisdictions. And then finally, I would say uh, targeted and restrained enforcement, advocacy for that. So for instance, in the context of Arizona, when there was an accident, a collision involving a highly automated vehicle, Governor Ducey's administration showed a great deal of restraint in, in looking specifically at the circumstances of that particular collision and not painting the industry as a whole and the technology as a whole with a broad brush. Um, that sounds really intuitive, but there are lots of groups out there that are going and saying, we need to get these things off the road, they're dangerous. Well, the vehicle in Arizona was identical to the vehicle that was operating in California for testing purposes. And arguably, California has a more, well, not arguably, has a more onerous uh, a more onerous regulatory system for highly automated vehicles that may not actually adhere to, going back to regulatory competency, the goals that they're attempting to achieve. So I think if, if state level think tanks are to focus on one thing, it's gotta be regulatory modernization in the context of regulatory competency, definitional harmony, and targeted and restrained enforcement, right? Ashton. Thank you, Sal. So we covered the ground, now we're gonna go into the air, take off. <laughs> Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about drones, and the drone regulation is extremely complicated as anything we're talking about today. And um, we can separate into three separate categories that I think state think tanks should focus on. First one would be law enforcement and drones. And here states 
like Utah um, should decide what is the restriction that they should put on the drones when law enforcement uses them. Utah actually has this one law that limits uh, where police can collect data using the drones and uh, also provides a specific case where there is an exception, which is looking for missing persons. Um, so the questions of law enforcement and drones, they include a lot of very tough issues of Fourth Amendment and First Amendment being in tension, um, questions of security and privacy being in tension, and we can talk about it later, but that's the first area. People should really look into research and kind of take charge of on state level. Second would be the private civilian use of drones. Right now, if you have a drone and you don't register it, it's a felony. It's a federal felony to do that. Um, and um, the kind of the tension between the privacy here where someone flies their drone over your backyard and um, takes photos or videos of you and your family being in a pool or having a barbecue, obviously can create a lot of tension and a lot of um, high um, stakes situations. So um, that's also an issue that states, some states have already looked into, other states are just starting to think about and um, we should be very careful, but states have always been more forward thinking when it came to privacy. They have a lot of peeping Tom laws. They have a lot of, some states have paparazzi laws. Um, when journalists follow Ian around and want to yeah. take photos of him and he can't yeah, do anything about it because <laughs> he doesn't qualify as a public figure. But um, so states do have some expertise on this and they should lead um, the charge on this too. And then the last one is the commercial use of drones. So do you want Amazon delivered to you even faster? Do you want pizza or McDonald's and it's raining and you don't want to go outside? I definitely do. Um, right now on federal level, there are a lot of restrictions that FAA has put together that we can go into that basically stop that from happening. Now, um, the federal authorities and the state and localities are trying some different programs and figuring out the tension between this, I think the commercial use of drones is the hardest question um, when it comes to the federalism issue, because on one side we have interstate commerce and we have, you know, air is also roads. And raise your hand if you think federal government shouldn't regulate airspace. Okay, I see you, Jesse. <laughs> <laughs> it was a half hand ride. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but this is very crucial. We don't want to break federalism. I mean. I'm Russian and European, so I believe in one single straight line of authority, but the federalism, federalism seems to be working here, so we want to be very careful with that. So that's the third uh, issue area that um, I think we should talk about. Well, and you segue into kind of a couple of my follow-up questions real well, and, and the first one is on this concept of federalism, and we, we understand even Republicans in the Congress uh, at, and the federal bureaucracy are not necessarily interested too much in the principles of federalism. So from each of your vantage points, what kind of damage can be done at the federal level and what are some of the ways in which, whether it's through uh, preemption, litigation, policy making, um, what should we be paying attention to at the state level toward the federal government uh, to make sure that, that, you know, kind of technologies roll out effectively? Whoever. So I think in the context of highly automated vehicles, having a clear distinction about areas of competency is going to be particularly important. And I mean, we've seen the federal government in the two, sadly, it, it appears stalled pieces of legislation, the AV Start Act and the Self-Drive Act, assert a very, a very sort of uh, forward-thinking vision where the federal government will retain its traditional areas of authority when it comes to design, safety, and the performance of these vehicles. These are the hard points on the vehicles. These are the things that having 51 separate jurisdictions say whether or not you need a steering wheel and pedals could really serve to uh, inhibit interstate commerce. Mm -hmm. So the federal government speaking with a clear voice on that is important, and yet they appear unable to um, because of a conversation about binding arbitration that is not looking like it's going to get resolved. Meanwhile, the states are in a position to, to work in areas where they have demonstrated the ability to have expertise. So that would be in traffic laws, that would be in licensing, registration, liability, and even in insurance, where we have a state-based system of insurance regulation that that actually, during the 2008 financial crisis, stood up far better 
than the centralized system in Europe to, to some of the shocks. But, but I think that has to be the calling card. We have to be looking at this on a issue by issue basis. It is not to say that the federal government won't have a role in the future of transportation or that the states won't have a role. It's that the role needs to be tailored to what they are good at. At the end of the day, what is the DMV in your state good at? Right. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, in theory, licensing 16-year-olds. The DMV in your state does not have the personnel to determine what a safe vehicle actually looks like. And the state should be actively seeking to have the federal government uh, assert its authority in that space. Jennifer, well, I think you... I, yeah, I was going to say, I, uh, I, I tend to be a little more pessimistic when it comes to us getting federal legislation on autonomous vehicles. You know, sometimes I sit here and wish I had taken bets with some people <laughs> on uh, whether or not this would have happened by now. Um, because of the demosclerosis of Congress. And I think when we do see federal action, we are going to see it more in the soft law form. We're going to see more of the NHTSA guidance on autonomous vehicles and not hard, hard law legislation that formally preempts the way that something like AV Start or Safe Self Drive would. Um, but there's another element of federalism that needs to be discussed too, which we alluded to a little bit earlier in terms of the preemption between mm -hmm. cities and states. And this is becoming an emerging issue both in autonomous vehicles and in micromobility with things like the scooters. So we saw about earlier this year uh, San Francisco trying to put additional restrictions to California's restrictions on autonomous vehicles and what would be necessary to test there. We've seen cities um, ban scooters or my personal favorite, Nashville literally picking up all the scooters and taking them to City Hall until the innovators came and decide to negotiate with them, kind of like you would an eight-year-old's toys or whatever. <laughs> and then they caught the city, uh, members of the city staff riding them around in the Jeez. city hall. Oh, no. um, but meanwhile, we have seen cities that are really good. We've seen Pittsburgh open it to driverless cars before Pennsylvania could do legislation. And we've seen Memphis, once they saw Nashville messing up, enter into kind of some competitive federalism and say, hey, Bird, if you want to come over here, we're happy to talk to you about what you can do in our city and really has kind of become the gold standard for what, how cities can innovate in the scooter space. So I think that in some ways the better preemption conversation to be having at a state level right now may actually be the city versus state. What's interesting about Europe and US is the role's a little bit shifted here. Amazon is testing out uh, drone delivery yeah. in UK instead of here because it's easier, which is the first time uh, regulations in Europe are more light approach than in the United States that I know of in an innovation space anyway. Um, so when we talk about preemption, I also think we should not jump into it because even some people with good intentions would say, why don't we preempt on federal level so uh, people can innovate and disruption technologies can move forward. But you don't know where exactly this technology is going. What will change in the next Congress, let's say, or what would change in the next election cycle? So you don't want to have a one framework from the federal level telling every state what they should do, even though they are very different. There is Montana and then there is DC. Well, DC is not a state, but we do want that. Um, uh, but then there are like very high density states that would, you know, have different requirements and different problems when it comes to drone delivery. And when we talk about drone delivery, we also should think about wildfires and emergencies, state emergencies, or federal level of emergencies where drones can actually save lives. And what they already do in Africa, where um, in a lot of countries that were suffering from different outbreaks of malar malaria and, and so on, other diseases, drones were the first ones there. They were the first responders who were able to deliver medicine, food, water, and help the population. So drones are so crucial that we don't want to kind of limit them from neither level. But if we let the states try out different approaches first, that would be a good way of figuring out what works and what doesn't, and then maybe we can talk about federal preemption on a more high general principle level. Okay, great. Uh, shifting to political strategies, I mean, you've got groups that have, um, some have C4s, some have C3H designations. JMI doesn't even have a C3H, we're just a straight C3, so our lobbying ability is very limited. Uh, what should think tanks that have 
a, a, an ability to do issue-based advocacy or have a C4, what kind of strategies should, should they take and what kind of coalition partners should they be looking for at the state level and nationally? So, I can go first. Yeah. Um, I think this is the most bipartisan issue no matter what angle you look at it from. If you look at drones and law enforcement, it's about Fourth Amendment and if you believe that Fourth Amendment is a very cornerstone of this issue. So it's very bipartisan and you should go to groups like local ACLU and local other human rights groups that um, might have not agreed with you on other issues. Then it comes to more commercial use, I would suggest they go to more federal level think tanks that have been doing this for a while, to Yan and to us and to Mercatus and ask for research. And in general, I would say that um, for both C3s and C4s, right now the most important thing is to educate to educate the public, to educate the legislators and the executive branch, mm -hmm. and to show that we care. So they can't, don't pass something real fast without us knowing. So I think that that, that is absolutely the case. I, I guess I would hasten to add, I, I would wanna make sure there's outreach to the regulatory community. They often feel like they are not, at the state level in particular, transportation regulators, right? They go to conferences of their own and are not the first people that you're necessarily interacting with uh, as a, as a state-based think tank. Um, I, would, I would say that also uh, partners in industry and trade associations are not only great resources for you, but you can spend a lot of time talking to them and, and discussing the, the way in which a uh, proposal that might otherwise uh, not uh, encompass all of sort of the, the liberty-minded principles that you might otherwise hope for, uh, why that might be a good thing to pursue. Um, so I, I, I would just end on the fact that this is something that in the automated vehicle space we've seen there is not a clear partisan sort of breakdown in what would be uh, regulatory approaches that have a deleterious impact on the deployment of these vehicles. We saw really problematic inter uh, legislation introduced and nearly passed in Indiana, which is about as bright red as they come. Likewise, we've seen blue take states take a leadership role. So I would say don't put people or members into the traditional categories that you might otherwise classify them in, particularly on these sorts of issues. Oh, can I just piggyback um, about the blue states? Yep. Um, drone delivery, as I said, will help in a lot of cases, and this will, they will serve underprivileged areas first. Mm -hmm. So that's a way to reach out to the Democrats. Yeah, uh, coming at it from a C3 approach, I definitely agree that education is a key role. A lot of times, bad technology policy seems to come out of a place of fear. A, a, the idea that something must be done because the driverless cars are coming and this is going to, you know, the scooters are everywhere. And yes, I wanted more transportation options, but not in my backyard. Right. Um, so I think that really educating people on how these innovations are able to work into our existing transportation ecosystem, mm -hmm. that how this process is working and why they are safe and effective and will make people's lives better is really a good role for state thinking. And I've got have. one more question and then we'll go to the audience because this is uh, inevitably an opportunity for us to be ahead of the curve on a lot of the policy discussions. However, communications and public relations need to be an integral part of it because it, it's, they're gonna touch the lives of everybody. Uh, so with that, uh, what would be some of the comms and PR strategies uh, that we should be looking toward um, to, to help alleviate the fear or create a better uh, environment for good policy to move forward. And just gonna... I would say avoid uh, utilitarian language where possible in the wake of collisions and accidents. Don't say you gotta break a few eggs to get to the better tomorrow if you can avoid it because as you would imagine, the policymakers are going, those eggs are my constituents, right? You are testing on public roads, bad things happen and the fact is, my constituents expect me to keep them safe. Never mind the fact that these vehicles are demonstrably safer, orders of magnitude safer. So to the extent that that sort of language and that sort of approach can be avoided, I think it'll go a long way, particularly in the context of highly automated vehicles, to making people more comfortable with them. What we see with innovation policy in general is, since it's disruption and new technology that we don't even know where it will go next, people often tend to go to sci-fi content, movies, books, just weird um, misconceptions they have. 
when thinking about it. That's the, one of the biggest challenges you need to uh, overcome and break that weird um, perception. You have to talk about technology in a positive way, the way it will help people, the way it will make your life easier. You forgot to buy your wife an anniversary gift, and now it's not a problem anymore. <laughs> uh, those things are definitely going to be the leading kind of strategy, in my opinion, mm -hmm. um, on getting to people. And also, as a lawyer, we need to make this easy and not talk about federalism and preemption unless we're in the room with peers. We need to talk about uh, your rights and federal government making sure you're okay, but also state government listening to you and hearing you because you are louder on the state and local level. So uh, make it simple, make it short, and make sure you reach um, population that you usually don't talk to. Great. Well, um, I want to jump in and allow for as much audience questions as possible. I'll jump up here so we can, uh, I can see folks, and I thought I saw right here. Connor Boyack with Libertas Institute, so welcome to Utah, everybody. Um, Ash, can I appreciate you talking about the drone bill? That was actually our bill, and privacy and surveillance have been a big issue for us. I wanted uh, the folks who have been focusing on uh, autonomous vehicles to talk about whether uh, privacy and surveillance have ever come up in those discussions. As we've been talking about this issue, it seems like no one is really focused on those implications as it pertains to, uh, much like with our phones, being able to track where a person is at any time in the car and potentially even being able to remotely shut down a vehicle or control where people go. So there's certainly trade-offs in uh, saved lives and so forth. What are the thoughts on the privacy and surveillance implications for this uh, emerging autonomous vehicle technology? I, I think there definitely is a conversation being had there. It's probably not quite as loud as the conversation in drones, in part because the technology isn't quite as far along in that regard yet. But there definitely are conversations, particularly at a federal level, regarding what privacy and security um, elements will be necessary in both the infrastructure for driverless cars as well as in any kind of black box data recording that's included in them. And, and I can say that some states like California have actually seen bills introduced, though not ultimately uh, realized, that involved outright prohibitions on the collection of certain kinds of data that ultimately would be really very useful in the context of a deployed fleet. So it is on the minds of policymakers as part of the larger conversation about privacy, but I would say it's not a particularly sophisticated conversation being had yet. I would jump in, even though I know you didn't ask me, and just mention that right now um, the Supreme Court jurisprudence does go towards protecting um, our Fourth Amendment rights when it comes to new technology. If you look at precedents, basically if you are flying over someone and you can't see something with a naked eye, you need um, a warrant or um, other requirements for law enforcement. But now we have a new court and I'm a little bit worried about the stance of a new court on Fourth Amendment, so it will be more up to states um, to put in those protections and requirements for transparency and right process. Other questions? Over there. Uh, Jonathan Howenchild with ALEC. And this is less a question and more an encouragement for state uh, think tanks to get involved in tech policy, especially along the, the drone um, aspect, for example. There are a lot of questions that states need to push back on the federal government. Um, and I, the, for those that aren't familiar, the FAA 2018 reauthorization just passed and had a number of drone-related um, drone related provisions. And a lot of them are concerning for me in the sense that it looks like the federal government is going to be preempting and taking away more traditional state authority. Uh, there is specifically a direction for the FAA to study uh, privacy-related issues, so the snooping paparazzi-type photos. And whenever you see a study like that, it's to lay the, ground, the groundwork to take away traditional state grounds. So I guess I'll, I'll put it in a question like that. Uh, I, to put it in, in something of a question, when we're looking at civilian use of drones and commercial drones, where do you see the federal government taking away traditional state authority that the these state-based think tanks could either work with their state legislators or work with others to push back on the federal overreach? Well, um, I think the area that would be most um, tense in, the, in this situation would be 
for regulation of the civilian use of drones. And I think states should definitely take ownership of that and lead the way on that and um, based on their, create their little laboratory and figure out what they want, whereas federal government, FAA uh, has a lot of regulations, for example, you can uh, fly a drone unless it leaves your uh, line of sight. So I'm, for, I'm pretty blind. Like, it would take me 10 feet and I can't see the drone anymore. Um, that limits my civilian use, even if I'm just using it for myself or taking photos. If I'm a real estate agent or if I have a wedding photography business or if I have um, just some kind of business that would make it better for me to have a drone. Because drones, they not only take photos, they calculate sizes of things. They, um, they can detect smells and sounds and so many things that we don't really think about. Um, and if states don't do anything about this and don't um, kind of get into this fight with the federal government, I think our innovation in that space will be limited. The next question. Right. Ray Hederman with the Buckeye Institute. Uh, we heard a lot about skill mismatch uh, this morning. Uh, another type of mismatch is ge geographic mismatch, where you have workers here, jobs over here. Do you have any cities that are starting to experiment, saying, can we use autonomous shuttles maybe to start replacing uh, public transport? Uh, bus systems become a very huge, costly part of budget, uh, city local budgets. So are any cities trying to be innovative, proactive, and embracing this technology to figure out, can they transport workers, can they do it in a more cost-effective manner? I mean, the two that immediately spring to mind, I know there have been some use of autonomous shuttles in Las Vegas as well as in Atlanta, but I don't think they're going beyond what already exists in the city. So I don't think it's been a kind of growth to the suburbs. Of course, that's one thing that a lot of us are excited about potentially with autonomous vehicles is it could expand the range of what are now exurbs or even rural areas are now much more commutable into a city if you can spend that hour in tr instead of stressfully driving in traffic, reading the newspaper or preparing for your day or, or anything like that. I would say this is another place where micro-mobility can come in, at least on an internal city level. Um, bus lines serve a purpose but there are certain areas that they don't serve. And we're seeing scooters and dockless bikes and even dockless mopeds be able to kind of serve that last, what was the last mile is now kind of the last five mile range in a lot of cities. One of, one of the big barriers is that a lot of states, and uh, in part this is because of federal action, actually are not in a position to have those sorts of technologies on their road legally right now. So that is something that they could actually take steps to enable in some cases. Yeah. I think Spence back there. You mentioned that the, uh, <clears throat> the skies are just like the roads. Do you see a possibility or a potential for like you mentioned, the commercial, mostly commercial use of drones, Amazon and whatnot. Do you see the potential or the possibility of a privately organized air traffic control for drones that could be spun up sooner than later so that, you know, people who want to commercially apply drones could sort of go to the states and say, hey, you don't really have to worry about this. We've already devised a system to make sure that the drones don't crash into each other or take video of people's houses or, or whatnot. Or does that have to be something that the government will come in and say, we have full authority over this issue and, and, and whatnot? Um, I think ever since aviation um, came into play, it has been a government um, space. <laughs> uh, do I see a potential poss possibility not right now. Does that sound like an interesting idea? Yes, but it would, um, it would entail a lot of very difficult questions on tensions and kind of merging um, public and private is always hard. Uh, but we can, we can look into it, we can think about private roads and a lot of countries have them and how do you regulate that? When it comes to airspace, it's just as of right now, it has even higher uh, public safety issue. And um, that would be, I think, one of the main um, stops to that idea. But um, in, this is 2018, and we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. 
I want to so. jump in on this because I don't necessarily think the full history of aviation is that airspace has always been considered federal at all levels, particularly. I, I certainly think lower level airspace is more up for conversation. My colleague Brent Scorup, who was on an earlier pad panel, is doing some very interesting work on those potential um, options. And one thing that none of us really discussed that is also a very exciting future of transportation innovation is VTOL, or vertical mm -hmm. takeoff and landing, the, the literal flying cars and things of that nature um, that fall somewhere in between drones and autonomous we vehicles. We should talk about it next year. Yeah. But I, I think, Spence, you, you hit perfectly on a future reason commentary as, uh, as they're, as they're uh, coming out. So, Other questions? Yes, Steve. Um, okay, so uh, the space and the roads uh, are all being uh, enabled by computers. Now, what's the issue here going on with cybersecurity? Um, you know, I can see uh, the potential for uh, hacking the vehicle and hijacking it or, or something of that sort. So, you know, um, do you think that there's a role here for, for government, or do you think that this is a self-policing thing uh, on, on the part of uh, manufacturers? So I, I would jump in on that and say that the manufacturers have a really important role to play, as they've already played in the context of uh, safety regulation when it comes to federal motor vehicle safety standards, right? So NHTSA has a really very robust recall authority, but it is very, it is far more often the case that a manufacturer will police themselves, go to NHTSA and say, we have a reason to be taking vehicles off the road. And so uh, part of that is having a, a really well-developed relationship and dialogue with the regulator so that they understand what is on the manufacturer's radar. Now, in the context of cybersecurity in particular, there already are clearinghouses between manufacturers and tech companies uh, to look at specific and known bugs and vulnerabilities. So they're, they're, they're talking to each other. When one manufacturer discovers an issue, the others know about it. I would say that having, having design-based standards at either the state or the federal level will only compound what security vulnerabilities may exist. So I would, I, would, uh, I would really hate to see regulators moving in that direction. That will ultimately make us less safe. And to add on to what Ian said, the software developers and the innovators, they know cybersecurity better than the government. government establish, if government establishes an X cybersecurity framework or protocol, it will be outdated in two days. Um, it has to, whatever would be worked out between public and private has to be very flexible because cybersecurity changes and evolves every day and our software engineers are the best ones to deal with it. Yeah, if you're gonna have regulation, you need performance-based regulation. Otherwise, it's just not gonna work. Mitch, you had a quick follow-up, Steve? I did get the, uh, the word from Chris, so we got time for one more, and I'm gonna take moderator's prerogative. So other than the three of you who are all kind of subject matter experts, if you had to recommend one other person or group to be on the lookout for either research or a white paper or someone to pay attention to uh, in social media who's at the forefront of these for our uh, audience, who would the person be other than each of you? I'll do this pretty much self-promotion, but the Emerging Technology Working mm -hmm. Group that okay. is part of the Federalist Society includes uh, amazing scholars from whom I learn every day. Greg McNeil Great. from California is leading it. Um, on the Federalist Society website, you can find all of their names and their research and links to their websites. I would ha they work on different aspects of emerging technologies, both privacy and cybersecurity and AI, and I would highly recommend looking Great. them up. Great. If you're not yet following Caleb Watney on Twitter, you should. He's really good, and he does great research in this area. He's also my colleague. <laughs> Jennifer? Yeah, I was gonna say, Caleb yep. was mine. I was also gonna <laughs> shout out uh, Brent, who was on the previous panel, also does a good amount of work on um, the 
airspace and the VTOL question especially, so anyone that's interested in drones or those um, questions, I would follow up with him here or follow him on tw Twitter. And then I would also add uh, Ryan Hageman and Alex Staff at the Niskanen Center, just more generally from the regulatory approaches that are being applied to these type of technologies. And you earlier had mentioned Adam Thierer. Um, yes. He's also an, an incredible resource. He's written a couple of books. Um, we've had him at JMI um, as well, and I would encourage folks to, uh, to follow him uh, as well. Great uh, topics on permissionless innovation. Uh, join me in thanking uh, a great panel. Uh, I think we've gotten us kind of...